Ghost lore is to be found in the literature or the oral tradition of practically every existing people. It goes back as far as our records go and emerges from the prehistoric state of man with many of the simple devices and commodities which are known to have developed at a very early period. Today, ghost law is still broadly believed in various strata of society. And while we cannot say that in the 20th century, advanced cultures are especially strong in their conviction about the subject, it remains as a conditioning force in the life of nearly every person. I think we can ask ourselves a question. Supposing that for ten generations an absolutely materialistic culture should dominate mankind, and that for this length of time the entire concept of the supernatural was systematically discredited, and uh, ten generations of young people came into the world convinced that there was no life after death, and that all metaphysical speculation was wrong. Would this end ghosts? Now, this is an interesting question, and I think the answer is distinctly in the negative. For several reasons, the most simple we will consider first. We do have isolated strata today of intellectuals definitely opposed to the idea of the supernatural in its religious or philosophical form. Yet we cannot say that this, these strata, this level of intellect, is free from the machinery by means of which the ghost concept gradually gained control of the human mind. So what do we have? We have a transference. We already have indications of this transference. Man demanding the wonderful and the miraculous, perhaps as an escape from the everyday monotonies of things, will simply develop a new kind of ghost law. The supernatural will be associated with other things. But as in the earlier form, it will nearly always become involved in the morbid. It will contain elements of a new kind of fear. The primitive man feared the unknown. He feared darkness, the elements. He feared the mysterious operations of natural law around him which he could not understand. But fear itself is not dependent upon the unknown. Fear can develop also around things known, but also recognized to be dangerous. In this we have the greatest panic we know, the panic of a cultured people faced with the problem of an electronic world. We also realize that science can develop its own kind of fear. The scientist can fear another scientist. Just as today, with fear and wonderment, with all the anxiety of an ancient tribal primitive, we wonder what is going on behind the iron curtain or the bamboo curtain, and we suspect the worst as we have always suspected the worst. 
We can therefore create a new ghost law around the monsters of Frankenstein which science can bestow. We can begin to think of the ghost of a completely mechanized existence. We can even fear that the machine can turn against man. We begin to recognize how man, a comparatively puny factor in life, plus the greatness of a mechanistic skill, can become the greatest tyrant of all time. So our fears simply change their appearances. But fear nearly always lingers on. Now fears are very much akin to hopes. We use the same machinery in the conjuring of both. But I haven't noticed in any recent years any great outburst of optimism concerning the future or even the unknown with which we struggle today. Nearly always our subconscious ghost lore runs into the negative. We are not particularly certain that an invasion from Mars would be a group of kindly persons coming to pat us on the head. We suspect they will come to invade. And all the artistry at our command cannot make the unknown appear amiable to us. We associate it always with some negative force, with some anxiety or some mechanism of fear. Thus, those very circumstances uh, which might almost certainly indicate a coming good will be distorted by a great many persons into an immediate peril. It is something about ourselves. And there is something in all ghost lore that tells us about ourselves and gives us a clearer insight into the structure and activity of our own psychic entity. So with some thinking along this line, let us look into it a little further. What is the origin of ghost philosophy? Well, there are several possible answers, and perhaps all of them have a certain measure of truth. First of all, the forthright possibility that there are ghosts, that there are uh, beings from an invisible world that can come to haunt us in this mortal sphere. Nearly all peoples have believed this, and almost every faith or philosophy that has had any concept of survival of consciousness after death has envisioned the possibility of the consciousness of the dead either being concerned with matters in this world or in some way able to bridge the interval between the living and the dead to return and in some way confuse or complicate mortal affairs. So we have this first basic possibility. We must frankly admit that it has never been disproved, but that in various periods our attitudes are of different degrees of sophistication about this kind of a problem. A simple example of our meaning, I think we have mentioned before, but we can fit it in again because it seems to help. Many persons, missionaries, explorers, and adventurers, have left the comfort and security of a rather prosaic New York apartment and have moved into the jungle, the wilderness, or the desert. Here they have mingled for many years with the natives of those parts, and finding most of these natives to be believers in the supernatural, something has happened. One by one, these blasé Westerners fall under the spell of the primitive magic, and in the course of a few years are Western-educated, 
college graduated, hard-headed intellectuals begin to see spooks. They see them because they live in a world that believes in them. And gradually this influence moves in upon the person. Now, if there was no core in man for such an influence, it probably would have little effect. But while this belief in the supernatural has been sleeping or dormant in the sophisticated person, it cannot be said to be dead. Under sufficient temptation and pressure, it will come to life again. And many, many travelers and explorers bring back to our rather disbelieving attention weird and wonderful stories of things that have happened that just shouldn't have happened in the well-regulated universe we think we belong to. Thus this uh, belief, this almost pressureful desire to believe in ghosts and spirits, certainly lives on and continues to affect us. Some of our psychologists were of the opinion a few years ago that the trouble originated from the wrong indoctrination of children, that the modern child should not be exposed uh, to Grimm's fairy tales or Anderson's fables, that we should not feed the small child with stories of gnomes and sylphs and salamanders, that we should carefully protect their prosaicness from infancy so that they would have no such uh, internal susceptibility to the belief in such things. There was quite a battle not long ago over the probability that Santa Claus was undermining the psychology of the young, that it just wasn't right to deceive children even in this way. Actually, the main trouble seemed to be that folks did not want children to develop pleasant ideas about the unknown. If we had to deceive them, let's show them how morbid and sordid everything is. But we have come to the conclusion that this is true. The truth is to cause the child to believe in nothing. This last, uh, these last two Christmas seasons, some new psychologies have appeared, and several specialists in child psychology have said, let's have Sandy Claus back. It is not as detrimental to the child as an average evening in front of the television. <laughs> if the child must have some kind of imagination training, Let's not train it on the untouchables. Let's train it on something beside shooting it out at the crossroads. <laughs> or else we are going to have some other kind of ghost law in which every spirit is member of an organized gang or rides some psychic range with a six-shooter. Thus, uh, it now seems that if we must choose between certain things, it's time to begin to think of creating beautiful imagination rather than to continually support morbid aspects of the subject. Incidentally, in studying ghost law, we then come to the second possibility. Of course, the first is that the ghost is a real entity doing exactly what it appears or seems to be doing. The second is that the ghost is in some way part of the conscience mechanism of man. Studies in ethnology and in ancient social customs and of contemporary customs in other areas seems to, in, seem to indicate that there is some connection between the dominant factors of a culture and its ghost law. Also, uh, even in literature, we observe the great number of ghost stories 
that are of a revengeful type. The spirits appear to haunt the evildoer in one way or another. And so we become more and more interested in what nations and peoples understand by evildoers. And we observe, for example, in this study, that those virtues which a people particularly emphasizes, these virtues do not produce ghosts. But whatever uh, vices a people have endured through the ages and allowed to remain uncorrected, these vices engender ghosts. Now, in one nation, one nation, a certain group of virtues may be regarded as vices. There is no common conformity among human beings as to the exact nature of good and evil. Therefore, there must be conflict in conscience. To uh, one per people, a certain act is virtuous. To another, it is evil. And the ghost tradition follows this human concept. When the individual in a certain culture performs an action disloyal or disobedient to his own culture, he has a bad conscience, and he will very rapidly develop supernatural cults, which will be founded deeply in his own conscience reflexes. If, however, in his civilization that particular vice is not important, but another is, a new set of machinery will be set in motion, and different types of conscience mechanism will produce their psychological consequences. Thus, in a way at least, the ghost seems to be man's recognition of guilt personified. It comes into his consciousness as an avenging force which he believes subjectively he deserves. He has an inward feeling within himself that if he does ill, some kind of evil will come to him. That if he injures another person, that that person will haunt him. Well, we all have this experience every day, but we do not associate it with ghosts anymore. We simply think of it in terms of morality. Even though we're rather narrow-minded sometimes, rather intolerant, perhaps embittered, if we commit a very serious offense against another person, we cannot forget that person. We have created a bond with the victim of our own ill action. We cannot escape from the feeling that this person may sometime, some way, seek to avenge himself, because we believe we would do the same under the same provocation. So we begin to lose sleep. We begin to worry. And most of all, there is something within ourselves, a deep stratum of decency, that we have offended. And we believe sincerely in the mysterious workings of wrong, that a wrong done will lead to further wrong. That when we break the simple rules of gracious relationships, we are endangering something. Now, if we cannot get our adversary off of our minds while we are awake, we are no more fortunate when we are asleep. And we know that nearly all waking phenomena can be continued into sleep phenomena. That the individual in his dreams releases psychological pressure. If this pressure is guilt, if down deep in ourselves we know we have done wrong, this also becomes an element of our dream mechanism. While we are awake, we can rationalize. We can say to the man we cheated, or of the man we cheated, 
Well, perhaps he would have cheated us if he'd had the chance. We merely got there first, and we feel a little smug about the whole thing. But this is a rationalization that does not touch the deep psychic core of man. He knows in himself that two wrongs will not make a right. He realizes in his own uh, depths, nursed by thousands of years of moral and theological teaching, that to do evil is to deprive oneself of the strength of good. So in our sleep we are more honest than in our waking hours. And in our sleep also we are able to create a certain visual and auditory phenomena. The individual we have injured seems to rise before us as a person. And this has been uh, reported a number of times, a great number of times, in, case of, in cases of murder. The uh, villain of the piece was so clever and adroit in his per uh, perpetuation of his own secret that it is unlikely he would have ever been caught by the ordinary processes of law. But the majority of criminals finally confess. They confess because they cannot live with themselves. I know at one time when I was working in prisons, I had a long talk with a man waiting execution. He had killed in the heat of hatred. And he said that from that time on, his sleep had never been peaceful. Hundreds of times he had seen his victim and had relived this incident until finally he had confessed. Now, 3,000 years ago, it would have been, believe, been believed that this revisualization of his crime was a supernatural occurrence. And even today, there are many who would say that if this man saw his victim in sleep, and this victim pointed an accusing finger at his murderer, that in all probabilities the criminal had seen <coughs> a ghost. This is a question, however, which I think requires some thoughtfulness. In all probabilities, the ghost was the memory of the crime, something that cannot be separated from the person while he lives. In some nations, this almost invariably leads to suicide. The criminal, to escape the memory of his crime, must destroy his own consciousness. This is the type of thing that we find set forth in the visions of Brutus in Julius Caesar. And even though a crime may be committed theoretically for good cause, still the crime remains an act of violence that is contrary to the psychic integration of the human being. We are not created for crime. It is a false and disordered situation which must result in continuing pressure. Now, in the smaller ways of life where we injure other people, it is noted that we almost immediately develop a desire not to be near those people. To the degree that we injure them, we dislike them. And more and more, we wish to be relieved of their presence, for it reminds us of what we have done. The subconscious mind of man can continue to bring back these presences to us. Even if we no longer see the person, we can conjure them in our inner vision. And whenever we do so, the pressure of our own misdeed weighs heavily upon our conscience. Now, in some parts of the world where certain habits or practices which are not good are prevalent, ghost lore follows almost inevitably in this situation. For instance, in the Orient, where for many centuries the state of woman was far from acceptable. <coughs> 
She carried and had to bear in silence most of the abuses of the world in which she lived. The uh, suicide rate among Oriental women was very high three or four hundred years ago. And also, the living sense to a great measure, subconsciously at least, that they were not giving the women of their families and countries fair opportunity. If you go through the legendary lore of these nations, you will find that a heavy majority of their ghosts are women, because woman becomes the symbol of their own guilt. What they have done, they do not forget. Whereas in another culture where perhaps the general state of woman has greatly improved, or in primitive society where it was originally good, as among the North American Indians, you find no such predominance. It therefore does seem to indicate that there is this strong conscience mechanism. Now, modern psychology, going a little further into this problem of conscience mechanism as a possible source of hallucination, takes into consideration also the narcotic addict and the alcoholic. We are very familiar with the effect of alcohol as a cause of hallucination. We also know that this is true of many so-called narcotic and stimulant drugs. In these cases, the hallucinations are consistently morbid. You seldom, if ever, uh, have an account of an alcoholic with delirium tremens who's having a good time. He is frightened. The experience brings to his subconscious sensory perceptions the most terrible and terrifying visions and impressions. Sometimes things unseen but sensed are the most terrifying of all. So we observe that the alcoholic nearly always develops a pattern. And as alcoholism is closely associated with neurosis, and most of it arises from neurosis, we are not surprised to find the whole neurotic temperament of man released in the form of symbolic visions. These visions may or may not include uh, the true ghost factors, but they would indicate that to these neurotic individuals, the universe of invisibles is filled with monstrous shapes and shadows, of mocking specters, and of terrifying sights and sounds. We might assume, of course, as some ancient peoples did, that alcohol simply releases consciousness into another dimension. But it would be rather difficult to imagine anywhere in, a, in an ordered universe the dimension of existence which the alcoholic experiences. We must assume that it is his own, that it arises as a result of what he is and what he does, and the same would be true of the narcotic addict. Also, we have some experience that indicates that as the pressures of moral circumstance become more intense, that there is a tendency to precipitate them into the objective waking life. A bad conscience, conscience if it gets bad enough, disturbs not only our sleep but our waking hours. Uh, most of you are aware of the primitive principles of the Rorschach testing uh, used in a good many psychological uh, tests. Here, actually shapeless and meaningless masses are interpreted by persons uh, suspected of some neurotic tendencies. It is amazing how often these blots and scrawls and scribbles and splashes that are seen as the forms or likenesses of persons we have injured. In other words, we project these forms. 
we also find that we project other forms. An intensely devout person whose life has been comparatively free of destructive forces will see in these same blots and splashes religious symbols, figures of saints, and even in some instances the features of Christ. Therefore, what is there unmistakably becomes interpreted by our own imaging and projecting power. We can go even further than this. We can look around ourselves into almost any complicated pattern of environment and can use the very rooms and houses in which we live as a form of Rashok structure or symbol. And we can transform the flow of draperies or the leaves of a tree outside our window into some significant shape by our own interpreting. This is done constantly. But because we consider this to be a psychological phenomena, we are not overly perturbed. By further extension of the same process, however, realizing that imagery is not our ability actually to see something, that imagery is actually an integration in the brain of vibratory waves, of rates, that the picture that goes into the eye is not uh, carried as a picture into the brain, but more like a television picture, is carried as energy in space between the object and the interpreting power. We are quite aware of the image creating or image integrating power of the mind itself. Now, it is not impossible that a mind heavily psychotically burdened can create uh, involuntarily images which it can confuse with and mix with the normal image process which we use in seeing. Thus we can look out upon a scene, see a meadow that is there, trees that are there, and the phantom of the person we have injured, which is not there. We have imposed this phantom into our seeing by our own processes. Perhaps this is the reason, however, why the majority of ghost lore is associated with darkness. Darkness is a very strange catalyzing agent. In the light we are distracted by the forms of things as they are. But in darkness, strangely, darkness itself becomes a kind of curtain on which we can project almost any kind of imagery. Therefore, ghosts live at night, wander in darkness, and are peculiarly associated with the nocturnal experiences of man. They are involved in the negative or subjective psychic life, for man is much like day and night himself. He is objective in the daytime and subjective at night. And as his day processes and his day interests are gradually relaxed at night. His own internal becomes increasingly dominant, especially, of course, during hours of sleeping or near sleeping. So the ghost functions at this time, perhaps because at other times uh, we are too concerned with objectives uh, to become subjective to the impulses in ourselves. Now, wonder continues to rise why it is that man is unable to conjure, or very seldom able to conjure, benevolent spirits. And we have to study a little bit into the psychology of peoples, perhaps to find some clue to this situation. Ever since man became aware of morality, ever since he became conscious of good and evil. And certainly, from the time 
where the great codes of religion, morality, and ethics were first framed. From this time on, man began to experience a shortcoming. Most people began to know or to sense that they were not keeping the codes and laws which they claimed to believe. Most individuals examining into themselves find some shade of guilt, even if it is in the more common experiences of life. We know we ought to be kindly, but we are unkind when we feel like it. We know that we ought to be paragons of truthfulness, but a fib now and then is naturally indulged, especially if there's a little profit in it. We know that we should be fair, but we don't enjoy being fair. We enjoy doing what we want to and condemning other people if we feel like it. We know that we should be temperate, honorable, thoughtful people. But all of these virtues seem difficult to attain, and we have very little libido dedicated to that purpose. What we really want to do is what we please, and as we please, and when we please. Any other relationship with existence appears as a frustration. So from the very beginning, we have fallen short of those convictions which we knew were right. And for one person who could honestly say that he had lived well, there would be a thousand who could not say this without exaggeration. Uh, they get by, but in themselves they know they are not the person they ought to be. So out of this type of situation we have developed an almost universal guilt mechanism. It has become the common denominator of us all that we fall short. And the original word sin simply means to be less than we should be. And under that term, we are all sinners. Now, the next situation that has arisen is that codes and laws were universally believed to have originated in a divine power. And in the course of ages, we have developed elaborate theological, moral, and psychological systems. And in most of the theological systems, there is great emphasis upon the unseen. The universe of invisibles is held in religion to be more important than the visible world. And on religious uh, philosophy, this can rather well be demonstrated. Because if man is an eternal creature, a great part of his eternal existence is not lived here. It is here that we find only a fragment of the career of a being, if that being is eternal. Consequently, there must be a larger universe. There must be another world. There must be other places. And in theology, there have been elaborate explanations of these other places. There has been a wonderful description of heaven and of paradise and of places of blessedness and rest. Very few people, however, seem to have been greatly comforted by these stories. They evidently didn't expect to go to any such desirable uh, spot. Also, religion has greatly exaggerated man's fear. It has created vast areas of punishment, region after region of perdition. It has made a large part of nature into hell. And into this hell it has tipped almost any human being who ever lived here. The very few who might earn a universal salvation by theology, this very few is comparatively incidental to the innumerable mass of humanity which for one reason or another uh, has little to hope for, theologically speaking. 
As man got a little more intelligent and a little more thoughtful about these things, he began to wonder. It became more and more obvious to him that all this theological paraphernalia uh, seemed to be intended for merely one purpose, and that is to frighten man into a state of grace. We've tried that for a long time, but it never works. The individual who is good only because he is afraid to be bad becomes the secret criminal. There has to be something else. The individual has to do well because he believes in good and not because he fears evil. But when we try this, it also does not operate successfully in a social order. The average individual does not love good as much as he fears evil. So perhaps this is the reason why, in his imagery of the universe around him, there is more of fear than of hope. The individual who has not learned to love good does not experience good in the universe. His faculties, inwardly unfolded to some degree, do not carry to him an experience of good. The very way we live and the very way we think causes this world to be a problem rather than a reward. It is a punishment, and many systems of philosophy have held that the entire life of man is nothing but payment for an original sin. All these morbid factors have to affect imagination and have to influence rather morbidly our internal reaction to the symbolisms of creative imagination. They become definitely morbid neurotic symbols. If you uh, study, for example, the art achievements of neurotic peoples, you find that today great experiments are being made in the, the artistic symbolism to be found in drawings and paintings by the mentally disturbed. And these paintings, by the way, appear quite startlingly modernistic. <laughs> and uh, uh, there is an historical account of an exhibition in which the works of mental patients and the works of prominent modernists were hung in a gallery together, mixed up and no indication given as to which was by which group. The judges were supposed to sort them out. When the uh, judges, all experts in modern art, came to their final conclusion, they gave the first award to a homicidal maniac. <laughs> the, uh, the actual disturbance which we find in psychological living today expresses itself in art. Now, what is the drawing or painting of a mental patient more than the projection of symbols. Projection from within the self. Instead of using the subtle fabric of mental energy now to f create a symbol, the patient is using his hand and a brush or a pencil. He is expressing his own inward confusion, and he does so often dramatically, producing many spectacular and highly controversial uh, pictures which require a great deal of interpretation and study in order to determine their actual content. To a measure, man also, with his neurosis, interprets his whole universe. He makes with his own mental fingers modelings and shapes and diagrams and figures of his own peculiarities and places them upon the pedestals of nature. He is constantly working with this disordered content in his own nature and projecting it upon his environment. So altogether we have much to explain why the majority of ghost stories are melancholy. We also realize 
how the story of Hamlet could well represent uh, the maliciousness of revenge, how the disturbed mind, already heavy with doubts and subconscious fears, as was the mind of Prince Hamlet, could be led to a complete pattern of avengements. These avengements might be just. They might be well called for according to our way of thinking, but they destroyed the good and the bad. They left the individual the complete victim of a disorientation, whether we consider it a true ghost or a psychic ghost that caused the disorientation. Working constantly in this field of endeavor, I have become conscious uh, through long familiarity with a great number of contemporary ghostly situations, and have come strongly to believe that the majority of them, at least, were psychological phenomena, that actually the ghost incident can be explained by the actual study of the person who has the experience. We know, for example, that more than a hundred years ago, the planchette that we now call the Ouija board was publicly banned in France because it led to an epidemic of murder and suicide. Now you would think that kindly, good-natured people sitting around either consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously pushing a little table would occasionally come up with some very good news. Well, some of them did. There's no question about it. Most of the so-called good news consisted of consolation. Terribly lonely people, or those bereaved, found some comfort in actually or symbolically finding contact with those whom they had lost. But the overwhelming number of kindly, good-natured people moving a Ouija board got themselves into trouble. Nine out of ten of these uh, amateur psychics were finally victimized by their own psychism. Instead of coming out of the situation in, encouraged and strengthened, they developed all kinds of strange dependencies. And I remember very well the case of Ella Wheeler Wilcox, the American poetess. Uh, she believed that she contacted a person whom she loved. And as a result of her statements, this type of psychism gained sudden and extraordinary popularity. Later, she tried in every way possible to point out that this was exaggerated and that she realized that the publicity was leading to trouble. But of course, people do not listen when they do not want to hear. And the result is the mistakes were perpetuated and the timely warnings were forgotten. But on the case, in the case of the Ouija board, we have a very simple uh, evidence of a situation that can apply to automatic writing, can apply to a great deal of personal psychism, and also to a large part of mediumship. Namely, that by degrees, a situation that perhaps begins with hope ends in terror. Now, why should this uh, particular process uh, be true? I think it is because if we could psychologically analyze man, we would find 
that there is a thin stratum of faith, but a very thick stratum of fear. The individual, under some pressure, or perhaps only for pleasure or social reasons, attempts some mediumistic activity. Naturally, it begins with a semi-believing. It begins perhaps with a little hope and a little confusion, and it is motivated by the most uh, surface instincts of that person. He wishes to communicate with someone. There is no great moralism involved. He hopes that he can get a message or find a lost collar button or something. Uh, the level of the investigation is not profound. Suddenly, however, this person is caught in the peculiar net of his own psychism. He seems to be in the possession of a force or faculty which he cannot control. As time passes, he surrenders more and more of his consciousness and his common sense to this mysterious psychic faculty. And after a time, this faculty plums its way into the depths of his fear stratum. And little by little, what might have begun as a rather optimistic, cheerful, and even slightly profitable interest, ends up by the person becoming as hopelessly addicted to a morbid state as any alcoholic or narcotic addict. Suddenly, this, the temper of this association begins to change. By degrees, ominous things are introduced. Very often it ends in a strange gibberish of demoniacal uh, folly. Uh, the spirits suddenly seem to turn into imps and do nothing but punish us for some mysterious subjective fault that we have tried desperately to forget. All of this is a pattern and it works out so systematically that we have to come to certain other conclusions relating to psychic phenomena. Actually, therefore, there is much that seems to suggest that these mysterious psychic journeys are into some form of subjective consciousness within the person, that there is a universe within him, in which all of the archetypes of his own experiences are available. That this is a journey into expectancy, not into the unknown. That it is a journey into the ways of things which, with which we are familiar. That it is no longer to be considered as a place, but as a mood, as a sphere of personal experiences. If this be true, then the mysterious ghosts that we find there must also have some existence in ourselves. Perhaps they are the ghosts of our old selves. Perhaps they are almost anything we want to imagine them to be. But some way they seem to tie psychologically into a kind of anticipated state of affairs. Now, in the course of psychism also, we get into a great many important problems involving communication. In the old days, most communication between the living and the dead was communication by oracle. And the great oracle at Delphi, or, at, or the oracle of Trophonius, or one of the other classic oracles of the Greeks and Latins, uh, comes to our mind. But remember that in the oracle, as a means of interrogation, man did not attempt to communicate with man. Man sought the wisdom of the gods. Nearly all the state oracles of antiquity uh, were for communication with deities, not with the deceased. These deities, as the guardians, leaders, guides, and custodians of peoples, were therefore, we may say, the archetypal pattern of the cultures uh, which these deities were believed to sustain.
Consequently, we are dealing with archetype. We are dealing with man trying to discover the laws of archetype in order that he could obey them better, that he could understand them more fully. Though in this we cannot say that there is a, a real consistency between uh, modern and ancient psychic phenomena. Modern psychic phenomena nearly always involve some kind of communication with persons like ourselves of similar nature, consciousness, and constitution. And we are then confronted with another situation. Uh, what does death produce in the experience of the individual? Assuming that we are right, that idealism is the correct approach to life, that therefore man survives the grave and remains a conscious being, and that this conscious being has a destiny and some kind of an abode, even if it is in the extra-dimensional vistas of space. If we assume that this person has passed from one condition to another, what does death do to that person other than to separate him from a body? Does death change him? Does death cause him to become aware of a greater world? Does death make him realize a higher level of personal integrity? Is the individual after death better than he was while he was alive? Well, Socrates argues that point a little and comes to a sort of general conclusion which has some merit in it. One thing that every entity that has passed consciously beyond death must know that the average person here does not know, but only believes, namely that life is eternal, or at least that consciousness survives death. Now, this is an important thing if experienced by the individual with absolute certainty. If he does not experience it, then obviously he doesn't survive. And regardless of how he misinterprets it, if he survives as a conscious being even to misinterpret, he has survived. And the fact of his survival is inevitable. So we can say that he has certain values given by the very transition caused by death itself. We have no reason to assume that death and the world into which he passes would have any essential effect upon the development of skills or abilities which are peculiar to this world. It would not be, therefore, proper, I think, to believe that a carpenter who passed out of this life would be a better carpenter somewhere else because he'd have very little opportunity to experiment if we are correctly informed. But that he does have a new dimension of understanding given by transition cannot be denied. Now, if we also want to take the ground that many do take, that this other world is a better place, that in some way the being who passes there becomes wiser, Perhaps not more exactly wise or more skillfully wise, but perhaps more aware of the universal integrity. If it is assumed that this person, having departed from our way of life, comes closer to God, enters into a nearer relationship with the great causes of life, becomes more associated with divine beings, then we might have reason to assume or right to suspect that this person's integrity would be somewhat more matured, that they would have sense of value uh, better than ours, and having been freed from the bondage of the limitation of the flesh, would have some intuitive or inspirational faculties more released, or at least not less released, than they are here. 
This, in a way, causes us then to say, how can we have a vengeful ghost? How can a person who has passed into a better state remain concerned with the peculiarities and absurdities of his material condition? If an individual, by the process of death, gains contact with immortality or greater proximity to God, how can he remain unforgiving? If his consciousness is changed at all by this experience, might we not expect him to be in some way better than he was here? Certainly no less. If he is conscious, if he has gone into a universe of causes in which he is actually living in a state which we are seeking desperately to find in order to advance our own knowledge, is there not reason to suppose that in this larger state the individual would be susceptible of somewhat larger thinking? If this is the case, then certainly the things that concerned him here would concern him less. Problems which he couldn't understand here, he would intuitively grasp. And he would also have little interest in injuring those he has left behind, because he must be aware that injury has injured himself most of all. So to explain this mystery, there has been another line of thinking invoked. The possibility that an individual passing out of this life with an extraordinary fixation might remain in that fixation after death. That if this fixation had something to do with material things, and most fixations here have, that we might find this individual becoming a kind of earthbound being, unable to change, unable to be different, unable to do anything, but to remain an, embodied sh an unembodied shadow of what he was here and that this type of being would seek continually to continue the activities of this life and would try to achieve this through making contact with living persons here. Now, all this is highly suppositional, but it has been broadly accepted. There is one school which distinctly assumes that anyone who is dead is able to give good advice even though they never gave any good advice while they were alive. <laughs> there is a minor possibility that the advice could be better, but I doubt if it would be infallible. And in view of the kind of advice that is given, there seems to be something a little wrong in the whole picture. The earthbound person, bound by his own limitations, unwilling to accept change, perhaps even fighting the concept of his own survival, might present an interesting psychotic situation and might even point out that you can have extreme neurosis in the afterlife. It may rather simply continue the neurosis you have here. So in this condition, we examine some of the advice that crosses between the worlds. This advice breaks into two very definite patterns. One is advice of consolation, in which most so-called messages, either through mediums or through some form of internal psychic experience of the person himself, are messages uh, intended to give a certain uh, relief from fear or tension or stress. They are, for the most part, of little factual value, unless the simple fact that, that the person who receives the message is convinced that he is in contact with a person sending the message. This in itself may bring a certain consolation a realization that a loved one has survived death, or that that loved one might still be somewhere within communicating distance of the person still in this world. Uh, that about summarizes the value of the situation. Uh, the messages are, for the most part, of very little help 
either in exploring the nature of the other world or securing any valid description of laws or processes operating. Oh, there are reams on the subject, but these reams, when you put them together and break them down, have very little substantial content. Uh, they are well-wishing things and uh, could well be the product of a dreamer with a pleasant dream. The other type of problem that we run into is the problem of this psychism moving victoriously toward obsession or possession, in which uh, contact with a deceased person gradually leads to a highly prejudiced attitude towards relationships in this world. Here we have over-influence, which in most instances, in all probabilities, is subconscious over-influence. We have to realize that the individual has a very complex inner life, and unless by some discipline as represented by mysticism or yoga or Zen or something of this nature, this inner life is clarified and integrated, that uh, its testimonies are not especially valuable. In fact, the inner life of the individual who is not integrated may be a rather vicious thing. <coughs> Certainly, it will be a negative or morbid area of reaction. So little by little, this possessing or obsessing factor of the subconscious takes over. And we have one form, certainly, of obsession, which is nothing more or less than the neurotic part of the subconscious taking control of the whole life. This is uh, such an obvious loss that the ancient peoples thought it was a demon that did it. They didn't realize that we all have our own private demon, that every individual has a strata in himself which is unworthy of him and which he is fighting. But if by some cause or other the barrier, the defense against negation, is broken down, then this unworthy part flows into manifestation and may even break into a number of fragments and cause a multiple personality problem. These types of possession and, uh, and obsession uh, are sometimes held theologically to be due to entities. More often, psychologically, they are regarded as due to the loss of objective orientation. And this brings us into the probably the great crisis that the ghost come brings us to, and which has affected history perhaps more than we will ever realize, because the ghost has helped to make history. The ghost arises in the careers of the great. The ghost has forced amazing changes in policy. But for the most part, these policy changes have only been in the line, which you might term, of cosmic or karmic consequences. Let us assume for a moment that the ghost factor in this problem uh, comes into the foreground in the life of the individual and becomes disorientation. If you do not believe in these things and you stub your toe, you say, I'll have to look better next time. I'm just not thinking about what I'm doing. But if you do believe in the supernatural and you stub your toe, your first thought is to burn incense to three offended demons. Everything suddenly loses all proportion. One thing that suddenly does is to cause the individual to believe that evil is not himself, that he is a kind-hearted, good-natured, well-intentioned individual and somebody else is hurting him. Where have we heard this before? We hear it every day. It is part of our basic psychology that no matter what we do to other people, it could never be as bad as what they have done to us. And we go into a high competition in this area. But now comes the ghost. 
to take its place in this complication. Suddenly, we are no, no master of ourselves. Everything is turned over to a host of mysteries. Every deed could be explained by a psychic force stepping into our affairs. That uh, blind spot in judgment wasn't ignorance. It was some malicious spirit uh, blowing thoughtlessness into our minds. Uh, these things that we do, this cruel word, was a demon speaking through us. And when suddenly an upright citizen falls apart, it isn't a nervous breakdown, it isn't a psychological ailment, it is an obsession by some remote ancestor who was a swashbuckler. <laughs> suddenly the entire pattern of our own action is threatened. And in this threat to our own integration, has come what most people have experienced as a very demoralizing series of circumstances. If we could keep our own equilibrium, if we could accept the ghost as we accept a neighbor asking for some eggs, if we could take a matter-of-fact attitude on these things and keep on living our own lives, we'd be all right. But people with the matter-of-fact attitudes living their own lives are not the ones who see the ghosts. That's the difficulty. It is the lonely person, uh, the discouraged person, the sick person, the individual who has been battered and bruised by life, or who carries within themselves a tremendous pressure of grievances against life, a sense of injustices, a secret belief that the universe is not a very well-ordered place. This is the kind of person who in the loneliness of their own psychic lack of integration see ghosts. They are the ones also who go for advice. People who know the answers do not go for advice. But people who are seeking for something that is either not the answer or are unable to work out some solution to their present problem, or who fear tomorrow with a great terror, are the ones who seek this kind of help. Therefore, they are the most vulnerable to its negative reactions. They are the ones most likely to get into trouble, because they will never know, and no one can ever know, except themselves, whether this advice is truly coming from a superior source or whether it is pouring out of the involved cauldron of their own psychic difficulties. If we could be sure of this, if we could say without any question of doubt, psychic phenomena is genuine, and all mysterious phenomena is psychical. If we could say that, we'd have a certain leverage. We would at least have some yes-no answers. But as these stories unfold, all we have is a maybe. It could be, but not necessarily. It's probably not, but there's a chance that it is. And how are we going to solve this? How are we going to certainly determine whether a peculiar type of psychic pressure is coming from an outside entity or from that entity that nobody knows inside of the person. We know definitely from the study of these matters that psychological phenomena can produce practically every miraculous circumstance involved in psychism. So how are we to be sure? How are we to be sure that the advice is the advice that we need, or is only the advice that we want, and which has already given us lots of trouble under other names. The only uh, direct solution to the problem seems to be the uh, strange involvement of the human mind's visualizing faculties. The best answer we have to psychic phenomena at the present time is individuality, the individuality of the person. Consequently, 
if there is independent phenomena that in no way is susceptible of fraud, that cannot be produced by mechanical means, and this phenomenon is visible to several persons at the same time. This is perhaps the strongest evidence in favor of psychism or definite, true psychic manifestation. If, however, we are to involve this, we have to rule out a number of kinds of phenomena which appear to be visible but which could definitely be traceable to other causes. Some psychic phenomena, as moving of objects, can be regarded as a magnetic or electric phenomena, basically. I would not consider them to be genuine evidences of the presence of other beings or entities. All dark phenomena, phenomena in which uh, the actual circumstances are not visibly seen, as slate writing, where you can see the writing afterwards. It is not agreement of this nature that I am referring to. Let me give another example that might be nearer to what I mean. And I know one case of it which seems to me to be very pertinent. A large family is seated at table. Suddenly the door of the room opens, and a daughter, who is supposedly out on an errand, comes through the door, stands in front of the family, is seen by all of them simultaneously, and says very quietly, I have just drowned and my body is in the mill pond. As a unit, the family moved to the mill pond and found the body. I would say that is a tough one to explain away. The elements that are necessary for validity are definitely present. Eight or nine persons saw exactly the same thing at the same time and heard the same words. Your psychological equation is excluded. You can't possibly answer that by a psychological equation. You cannot answer it by any known imaging of the mind. There is, however, one modification that is possible, namely that the message was carried telepathically to the family, that it was the, th that it was the thought of the daughter and not her body which appeared, and that being a member of the family and being known by all of them with the same appearance the thought projection could have precipitated a common appearance. There was no way of measuring as to where they saw the person stand. But they all believed that she entered the door. Here we have something in which some form of extrasensory factor has to be considered. So from the very earliest time, there has been no time in which men have denied that psychic phenomena is genuine, nor have they denied the possibility of the outraged ghost. They have not said that such things cannot be. The question is to try to separate these cases and to examine into them, to discover the legitimacy of some and the lack of legitimacy in others. Except in cases such as the one I have mentioned, where there was no uh, actual prognostic, there was no actual moral force exhibited other than communication of fact, probably no harm was done. Perhaps a great comfort was given to the family. But where the communication drifts along over periods of time, we do find a definite deterioration on the part of the message and the person who receives it. So we are now in the presence of a subject that must no longer be regarded as one subject. <coughs> 
And we have to divide clearly between psychic phenomena and psychological phenomena. We are going to discover, almost certainly, that nearly all destructive psychological phenomena, uh, psychic phenomena is psychological. That the habit forming, the moral weakening, the frightening, and all of these things are essentially psychological. And that in all probabilities, if there are communications from one world to another, these communications are simple and factual, representing some urgent need that must be immediately met, but involving no habit forming, involving no tremendous allegiances or distorting the life pattern of the individual, no tendency on the part of the experience to dominate the moral character of a person or interfere with his individuality. So I think we have to realize that our ghost lore and all our ghost tales and everything that have to do with these things certainly represent a vast body of psychological lore built around one simple core circumstance, namely that there is continuity of life after death, and that this continuity can, under certain rare conditions, result in a positive communication, but that this is not a subject essentially to be toyed with. It is a subject to be recognized, a subject to be considered, but not one to be feared, and certainly not an art to be cultivated. It is something that, where it is necessary, it happens. Conan Doyle uh, gives us one or two very legitimate examples. So does Sir Oliver Lodge. The case in which the child falling from a railroad platform, uh, from a railroad platform, yes, uh, between cars, uh, just about uh, to be killed, was suddenly miraculously picked up and placed in safety. Uh, apparently by the deceased mother. He was an emergency. He was no indoctrination, no art, science, or religion founded upon something. It was the simple fact that it is possible that in nature sympathies extend between the worlds. But these sympathies must be maintained in a natural, dignified way. The moment they become crutches for neurosis, you have trouble. So our ghost lore is almost all of it undoubtedly psychological. But in those needs where it is very great, where it is very definite, these experiences have happened. And these experiences we do not deny. We simply point out that every individual who has had mysterious happenings in his life should examine them carefully to determine whether they are symptomological of his psychological needs. And if they are extended over a period of time, this is what they most certainly are. Whereas he may be able, out of a sensitive life, to recollect one or two positive occasions in which the chances are that he was the recipient of some valid communication. Each of these things we have to work out for ourselves. But it is very definitely dangerous to permit ourselves to become involved in a psychism which is simply another effort of a neurosis to break through and take control of a life. We must not let this happen. And one way is that in all matters in which we can be sufficient for ourselves, we should be. No one should have to turn to psychism because he is lonely, frightened, and uh, abused by his fellow men. No one needs to use psychism as a substitute for a personal life. Build a life. Develop character. Have an interesting and dynamic career. And then, if all other factors are correct, 
We are normal people with normal interests, normal attachments, normal associations. The streak of the mysterious may come flashing through at some time. But if we are normal, we will accept it normally. If we believe in immortality, we will not be excited at any demonstration of it. We will not suddenly collapse as beings and become the hopeless slaves of voices and sounds. If our philosophy is strong enough, we carry these things with gentility and we have no trouble. So we have to rationalize, build, and recognize that our rationalization must be big enough to approach with common sense both that which we see and that which we cannot see. Time's up.